Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney, and the director of the Stonewall and Ashley Museum and Archives, and we're very happy to have all of you here. And it is my distinct pleasure to have with us tonight the artist, at, uh, activist, uh, uh, photographer, um, um, lesbian, uh, scholar. Uh, I don't know what other titles to put here, but uh, uh, <laughs> everybody, please welcome uh, Joan Vitt Barron. Hello, Jeb. Hi, Hunter. How are you this evening? I'm great, thank you. It's really nice to have you here with us this e evening. For those of you who uh, don't know anything about Stonewall, we're located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we're one of the largest LGBTQ archives in the United States. Uh, we have over 28,000 volumes in our library, and our archive consists of 2,700 linear feet. So if you think about that, that is all the way up one side of the Empire State Building and all the way down the other side. Uh, it's mostly from the last quarter of the 20th century, um, although we do definitely have some pre-Stonewall stuff in there as well. And the archives total about 6 million uh, pieces of paper, which is really just an astonishing um, trove of queer history through the United States, as well as internationally too. Uh, we do these talks, we started these talks in the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis almost a year ago. This might be episode number 42 or 43. And it's really an opportunity for us to continue to do programming during this. And, and it's actually been very nice because we've been able to reach out to people and have talks with individuals who might not we, who we might not have been able to do it because they wouldn't be here in South Florida. Um, but if you are here in South Florida, we are opened. Um, and so uh, we're open every day from 11 to 5. We have all the COVID restrictions in place. So please come by and say hello. You can learn everything about us at stonewall-museum.org. And this talk tonight is uh, going to be recorded. And uh, you'll be, if you have friends who are not here, they'll be able to see it on our website in probably just a few, few days. And then you can also see all the past talks that we've had as well, which really it's been a great um, mix of different people, artists, thinkers, curators, young and old and the entire gamut. And so it's been really wonderful. If you have ideas for people you'd like to hear about, uh, just let us know. We are booked now through sometime in the fall, uh, which is great that people have wanted to share their stories with us and with you. Um, and, so that's, and so that's great. And if you don't get our newsletter, you can sign up through the website at um, stonewall-museum.org. Uh, we have two exhibitions up right now. Uh, one is called Off Our Backs, Early Lesbian Publications from 1950 to 2000, looking at some very early publications like Broomstick and The Ladder, um, and then some later publications in the 80s and 90s. And that was organized by Megan Kent, uh, who is the chief curator at the um, Arts and Culture Center in Hollywood. And then last week, or no, two weeks ago, we opened a show called The Saint, which was based upon the uh, legendary disco in New York um, that was open from 1980 to 1988 and was re really one of the big discos uh, in the United States. And uh, really it's that story was re really about the idea that they opened and then suddenly the second year that they were in the business, um, 700 of the renewal applications were returned by the US Post Office because they were undeliverable because so much uh, AIDS had such a big impact on the gay male community at that time. So both of those shows are up right now. Uh, you can see online versions of them as well as online curatorial talks. But if you're in South Florida, please come and see those as well too. Um, and also, let me say hello to my colleague, Emery Grant, who's behind the scenes here. Emery, reveal yourself. Hello, Emery, say hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Jeb. <laughs> hi, Emery. <laughs> and it's great. Thank you, Emery, for being there. And basically, what we try to do is we want to have a conversation, and we want you to put your questions in both the chat and the Q&A, uh, and we will get to them as we go along here. Uh, so feel free to load them in and we will uh, do our best to make our way through all the comments. And so feel free to offer a comment. Um, it doesn't have to be a quick question, but feel free to say uh, what, what's on your mind at any time. So I think that's all the business I have to get done here in the, in the beginning. So Jeb, um, where are we finding you this evening? Where are you? 
Well, I am on the traditional homeland of the Piscataway Indian tribe and uh, about less than eight miles from the US Capitol, which is still being guarded by thousands of armed soldiers. Yeah. And that's where you live now these days, yes. I live uh, right outside of Washington, DC. I was born in Washington, DC. Yeah. So is the fact, grew, hmm? Is that where you grew up, was Washington? I grew up in Washington and also in the suburbs of Washington, yeah. Maryland suburbs, not Virginia. So what was life like you, what was life for you like growing up there? Well, you know, it's a company town and the company is the US government. And my uh, father uh, worked at the Pentagon as a civilian. And my mother uh, was also a civil servant and worked uh, for the National Institutes of Health. So I have a great respect for civil servants. Mm -hmm. And yet I did not want to be a civil servant. I wanted to be a politician because yes. I thought they had the better uh, job because they got to make the decisions. And so my path was to become a congressperson. Mm. And I got thrown off the path when I came out as a lesbian. And uh, that was in the early 60s. Mm. And at that time, there was no path for lesbians to go into elective office because the chance that you would be blackmailed uh, was very high. And, you know, even though I had been in the closet, there was, you know, there were people, there was, there were letters, you know, I tried to burn all my letters. I mean, it was bad. Mm -hmm. uh, being in the closet is, not good. And it threw me off the path. And then the uh, Vietnam War came. And then I no longer wished to be part of the US government. <laughs> and uh, with a father in the Pentagon, that would cause some family strife. Sure. So um, it was. Uh, you know, I had worked in the Black Civil Rights Movement, and then the war came and I worked in the anti-war movement. I was in graduate school in uh, Oxford in England, and we had an underground railroad, you know, to get the deserters from the army to Scandinavia. And, um, you know, I, I, came home and I got involved with the women's liberation movement and haven't looked back. <laughs> That's great. So just to let people know, of course, too, uh, you went to Mount Holyoke and of course you got your degree in political science, as you say, and then you went on to American University and got a degree in communications. Uh, and then, as you say, you studied at Oxford for th three years, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, but uh, AU, that, well, that was a whole different thing. What happened was I went from Mount Holyoke to Oxford and I was still studying politics. Yeah. And it wasn't until later uh, that I went uh, to AU. Got it. Got after it. I came back to the States. Yeah. So um, do you have any idea what ignited the activism in you um, at that period of time? As you say, you were involved in the civil rights movement and then the anti-war mo movement. Um, um, but um, where, where did that come from in you at that time? Well, I believe that um, somebody actually wrote a thesis about this and they, they had a very good phrase, which I'm not remembering, but it was something about the desire for justice, that it was just sort of an internal um, something that made me want justice. And, and just recently, 
in one of the reviews, somebody called my imagery representational justice, mm -hmm. which I thought was so interesting because it was kind of a, you know, the same thing. And I was, you know, I was raised by liberal parents who were very liberal and until I became a lesbian and then they were a little less welcoming of that. But um, I think uh, some, something in me just wanted things to be fair, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Yep. You know, they're the kids who want fairness and sharing. <laughs> they're the kids who have a little more trouble with it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is you've spent a lifetime w working it through a variety of different ways, spending a lifetime in w working in that area. And it must give you, um, hopefully it gives you a tremendous amount of pride and satisfaction that you have spent a lifetime uh, from being a kid to, to today, working to try to make things better for other people. I, I don't think pride is the way I would describe it, Hunter. I think I have been fortunate to be able to do what I wanted with my life mm -hmm. and that I, I had work that I believed in. I mean, I feel like uh, in a way, you know, that's a great privilege. Mm -hmm. Not that I had enough money to even have heat in my dark room for a lot of years. You don't make a lot of money as a lesbian photographer, but doing work that you believe in and that you care about really uh, makes a great difference. Am I lost? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, I think you're fine. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, I think, I think it's, um, that's, that's the part that's that's good. The how much you have accomplished or achieved is never very uh, clear, and it's never enough. Well, and of course, that's that leads me to the next question. What you and I talked about a little bit more, and I'm not so much interested in going through the details because I know you've talked a lot about it over the years and the Furies Collective. But there was certainly a lot of, of um, civil rights that, that you were involved with at that time, and particularly around um, issues having to deal with um, uh, gender discrimination and, um, and other ways in which women were excluded. But so that was in the 60s that that started, if, I, if I'm right. And- 70, 71. 70, all right, 71. And now today we are, um, we're 50 years later. Um, as you think back about that, in looking at the world today, um, do you feel progress has been made? Um, do you feel that things are better? Um, how do you feel about it? I feel that things could be a lot better than they are now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that in some ways they are better now than they were then. And um, even though we're in such a terrible time at the moment uh, because of the virus and because of the upsurge in hatred and violence being fueled mostly by racism, um, I still feel hopeful because I think that the, the uprisings uh, that we've had this year and the uh, people becoming more aware of some of the things that uh, have been going on forever, but without uh, white awareness, I think what I what I'm seeing now that gives me hope is that people from all different movements understand the need to work together to bring about the changes we need that will make a more 
equitable society and bring more social justice. And I think, you know, where we had a lot of separate movements, I feel like people are coming together around um, all the structural kinds of changes that we need. I think that's I, that's really wonderfully said as far as I'm concerned. I think, you know, it's, and it's, of course, it's so complex when we think about our sexual orientation or we think about our race or we think about our gender, we think about our class and all those ways in which we all have or don't have a leg up in different ways that it's really nice to be able to think about how can we just sort of move all those things to a side and just really try to create rights for everybody. And also the other thing that I always like to think about in this is that somehow people need to understand that rights are not a limited quantity. There can be there can be untold amount of rights that can be given to people. And simply because somebody is given a right somewhere doesn't mean that you are taking it away from someone else. Yeah, the scarcity mentality is very destructive. And you know, we really need to think uh, about the abundance that we could all have if we had an equitable society. And um, I just, um, I'm seeing uh, that um, Emory is going to put up some of the resources that I had uh, given. Are you gonna do that, Emory? I think they're popping up in the chat that yeah. Yep. There were a couple of things that I felt, um, you know, being older and being housebound for a lot of the past year, I was looking for ways that I could give support to the people who were out and struggling and on the front lines of the struggle. And so I wanted to share with people, uh, especially if you put up the one about Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, support because we're going through such horrible uh, thing just this week, but also the movement for black lives, which has been there uh, doing amazing work um, all uh, year and prior to that, but really taking off this year, I think in a, in a new way. And, yeah. um, and then mutual aid societies, which I believe in so strongly because they're in your own community and they're doing the work that really needs to be done for survival for people who need the basics of survival during this time. And you're talking about food, you're talking about shelter, you're talking about clothing, you're talking about yeah. companionship, you're talking about really those core things that many of us, of course, um, unfortunately take for granted and we have access to. We have a question here that I just want to pose only because it's it's somewhat similar. And of course, then we're going to get to the book. Of course, what we're here to talk about is eye to eye portraits of lesbians. And oh, want... look how good that looks. Oh, <laughs> you recognize that? It looks oh, great, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I still get surprised at how wonderful the, the reissue great. looks. But let me ask <laughs> Let me put a quick question out here from Lisa, who says, Joan, I came out in 1973, and I remember well the amount of sexism in the mainstream yeah. community and the gay community. Uh, was that your experience, and do you see it as any different now in the LGBTQ community? Do you see, do you see sexism um, um, any different today in the LGBTQ community? Well, the reason that we became lesbian separatists was because of the sexism in the, uh, the male dominated gay movement. It was terrible. Yeah. And then uh, because of the AIDS epidemic, everything shifted. Um, I think that is really what, what shifted things. And because lesbians showed up for gay men when they, they needed that. And then uh, things were better. And then the world in general became less sexist, including gay men. But sexism is huge problem still. 
um, the amount of violence against women because they're women is horrible, you know. Um, the sexual assaults, uh, the violence against trans women is maybe the worst. And um, the LGBTQI plus movement is not as feminist a movement as it should be. And it's maybe a little more feminist than it was and a little less sexist, but it's still not good. Yep. We do, however, have a lot of women leaders uh, in, uh, in our organizations and in the movement. I mean, it was lesbians who founded Black Lives Matters and uh, lesbians, uh, you know, are speaking up and doing the work in so many movements. And it used to be that um, it was really hard to have our voices heard. And I think that's not the case anymore. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good segue to talk some about the book. So this book first came out, I, uh, I, I first came out in 1979? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was reading some of the, the notes. And at the time, um, you couldn't put the word lesbian on the cover. Is that right? Well, nobody did put the word lesbian on the cover of a photography book until Eye to Eye. And th that makes a difference, I think, because you don't know that the people inside the book are lesbians. <laughs> you don't <laughs> say so. Right. So, I mean, there were plenty of books with the words lesbian, on, well, not plenty. There were books with the word lesbian on the cover, but they were not photography books. And so um, uh, how, did the, how did the book first come to be? Well, actually, I'm sorry, let, let me take a step back. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about your career as an artist and as a photographer and how that came about. Well, uh, when I was in the Furies Collective, which was directly after I had come back from Oxford University. I was um, convinced by my collective sisters that I should stop using my verbal skills hmm. because I could argue really well. I could speak and write really well, but I had learned how to do that in very privileged, very patriarchal institutions. And that meant that in a way my mind had been colonized. And the way that I needed to express myself was a new, fresh, revolutionary, unpolluted, uncolonized way. So I needed another tool. Mm. And since I am not much of a painter or musician, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try photography. And I fell in love with it. I, I really did. I just taught myself through a correspondence course, which is like if you would learn on YouTube, only it came in the mail. And uh, I took a job at a mom and pop camera store. And uh, I've, I've just enjoyed being a photographer ever since. But yeah. I, I didn't consider myself an artist at all. I just considered that I was using photography as my tool to do what I wanted, which was make a revolution. So amazing to be able to use, and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to disagree with you, but it's amazing to use your art uh, as a way of, of uh, furthering your desire for revolution. It's really, because of course you, your work is very artistic. You do 
you do a beautiful job with a lot of these I images that you have. So um, how many years have you been making work? Making well, work? I, I started in 1971. Yeah, and you're still making work t today? Mm, I would not say that I was. Okay. I have no camera except my iPhone and I do with my iPhone what I think most people do, which is photograph my family, my <laughs> granddaughter and my vacations, if I get any ever, you know. Um, I, I made the transition and I can say this to you as a museum and archives, I made the transition from making new work to making sure that my work was preserved and to helping other people preserve their work. And um, so now I'm going to ask uh, Emery to put in the, some of the information about oral histories because one of the things I, I do is encourage people to give oral histories and take oral histories uh, because I, you know, a lot of my work has been to document our lives as LGBTQI people. And because I came from a place where there, there was no historical record of those lives. And I'm still interested in, in building and increasing and expanding that record. So uh, that's why I encourage everybody to, you know, preserve your own photographs and um, send things to Stonewall, send things to Lesbian Nursery Archive. You can, there's a link also about how to, um, uh, you contact Lesbian History Archive, and I think Emery will put your link in there, sure. uh, so, you know, so that we preserve our history because all of us are part of that history. And and uh, I say amen to, to that. And of course, while Emery's getting these slides set up, I mean, uh, I think the thing that's really important is the fact if we don't lay the history down, someone else will write the history for us. And so we've got the papers and we've got the images and we have the documentation and, and it's really up to us to lay that uh, to lay that history down and be sure that it's preserved. And of course, that's why a place like Stonewall exists, which is great. I know your papers um, are preserved at Smith, and I think that that's terrific mm -hmm. that, that they are there. Um, and your papers and a lot of your work is there as well too, which is really great. Um, and, and so somebody just raised a question about the photos behind you, which of course is really lovely as well, as well too. Um, uh, is that a Bernice Abbott I see there on the left? My screen's a little- Yes, do you yeah. wanna know about them? These are my ancestors. These are oh, my, my lesbian photographic foremothers. Yeah. So I here, this is Bernice Abbott's uh, Photograph of Janet Flanner in 1927. And for those of you who don't remember, Janet Flanner was an editor at the New Yorker for many years, and uh, was uh, she re really was very influential in the 30s and 40s. Uh, just great. Um, and then in who's the next? It, in the middle is Alice Austin. Fabulous. This is her picture of her friends Julia Martin, Julia Brett, and herself, and they are uh, all dressed up and um, doing what they called larking about. <laughs> and uh, there, I'm gonna tell you, this is a fabulous photograph and you should look it up and you should go to the Alice Austin Museum whose executive director, Victoria Monroe is with us tonight. Hi, Hi Victoria. Victoria. And it's a wonderful uh, museum. And you will find the secret of the umbrella if you look at this picture when you can see it. And then and the Victoria, third Victoria, picture. Victoria, uh, Victoria, the Alice Austin House is on Staten Island, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, yeah, is that right? Okay. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, yes. And, and the, the, the third picture yeah. 
is Francis Benjamin Johnston, who uh, was another documentary photographer from Washington, DC. This is her self-portrait that she did in 1896. And she has got a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other hand. And she's got her legs crossed and she's showing her petticoats and she's doing everything, you know, a lady isn't supposed to do to prove that uh, she's a new woman. Excellent, excellent. Well, they're just and, great. And I love having these in my home and look at them every day because um, they are my inspiration. They are my foremothers, but they were not able to be out and yeah. they were all lesbians. Yeah. Um, and uh, Although, I, I a reminder. Ber Bernice was able to live with her partner in Munson, Maine for uh, a long period of time. Um, uh, she, she, she lived was... with Elizabeth McCausland for yeah. years and years in New York. They had two apartments facing each other, mm -hmm. and um, but they were not out. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at what Emery has uh, up here about the images that you were just talking about. Oh, he doesn't have those images. He has the images from the book. Right. So let's take let's take a look at this first one, Emery. If we can pop this one up here. Yeah, it's it's there. Yep, there it is. Yeah. Um, so tell us um, tell us a little bit about this piece, Priscilla and Regina in Brooklyn, and I can't quite make that out. Is that 1979? Let me look up. Yes. 79, yeah, 79. Great. This um, image was made at a Azalea picnic in uh, New York City in Central Park, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Azalea was um, a black lesbian group and they published one of the first uh, magazines and they were having a picnic in the park and I was there and there was softball. So you knew it was a lesbian event. <laughs> and um, these two beautiful women were resting and I photographed them and talked to them about it when they woke up. Well, they're, they're... They're such a, it's such a beautiful couple, uh, a beautiful couple. And you have this wonderful poem, uh, which you do with a lot of the, the work. Um, you mix uh, literary accomplishments with your work. Um, talk a little bit about that process for you. Well, it, it, you know, it was a great privilege to be able to put the work of such wonderful poets as Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich in my book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't maybe understand, but in the early part of the lesbian movement, the poets were the real rock stars of the movement. They, their work was uh, so powerful and so wonderful. And we flocked to be able to hear them read it, you know, in person. And I just loved the work. So I asked if I could use it and was fortunate that they agreed. That's wonderful. Could I get you to read this short poem? No. <laughs> I totally <laughs> understand. But I just hope our audience can. I, I think I, I would, I, what I would do is I would encourage people to go to YouTube and other places to find Audrey reading her own work because it is, unless you hear it in her voice, I mean, that's the way to hear it. Yeah, uh, well said. I just wanna be sure that people take the, the time to actually, so this piece is the black unicorn that you that, that you placed here. Let's go on to the next slide and take a look at that. Oh, so we have two images here on the next one. So mm -hmm. here on, on the left-hand side, um, I can't quite make out the text there. It but. says, uh, 
Makara, Marta, and Burning Cloud, Washington, D.C., 1979. They are actually sitting on the Capitol steps. You can't tell that from the photo, but that's where they are. It was a demonstration. And uh, that's where I made the picture. And do you remember the circumstances of that particular demonstration? I don't. But you can see she has a lambda pin, yes. burning cloud does. But it was, I don't know, I don't know that it was an LGBT demonstration or not. I can, um, I can look it up, but it's not in my mind at the moment. Yeah. You know, I'm 76 years old, Hunter. I don't remember a lot of things. Uh, I, I feel your, your pain. It's, uh, it's one of those things, but of course it's wonderful to, to speak about them. I see she's holding a bird in her hand uh, as well too, which is really sort of interesting. Uh, Let's talk about Gwendolyn. All right. So Gwendolyn- Because I remember where I took this one. I was, was, <laughs> here's my guess. Gwendolyn is on, you took this on Christopher Street. Uh, probably you recognize the building. I recognize yes. the church. I recognize, I forget the name of the church, but- uh, Yeah, the church. Yeah. It, you know, it was a big church, a very big church. Yep. It was an event called the Forum on the Future. It had all the feminist leaders in it. And um, Gwendolyn was leafleting because what was at that point called third world women or women of color were not represented. And do you remember the exchange with her? Um, well, you can see she's <laughs> jumping out of the picture, giving me a, a flyer, which she I did. took. Yes. Well, of course, she seems so. She's the reason why I asked that question is, of course, she is um, she is responding to you as a photographer with such a beautiful smile. And with, it, it just seems like such love coming out of her heart that she's responding to in, in this way. It's really charming, so. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's because she was complaining because nobody was paying attention and I was paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were out doing street photography, was that something that you heard a lot that people were happy uh, to have you pay attention to them? No. No? Yeah. <laughs> no, what it's you, here's a difference between being an LGBTQ photographer and another sort of street photographer. The only time you can photograph on the streets is when people are demonstrating, when mm -hmm. they choose to come out and make themselves known as LGBTQ people. There's no, at that, uh, for years and years, you know, there was no like gay neighborhood. You know, you, you, you don't live in a place where you can just go outside and those are your people. You can't go into the bars where your people are because those are the safe places where people can go and feel like they won't be identified and they were the, the gathering places that were protected from photography. Um, so th there was no, you know, like casual street photography. There was only demonstrations, yeah. pride parades, freedom marches, you know, when people chose. And even when people chose to come out, mm -hmm. I would, have to ask them because people would say, no, 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 you know, I'm here on a visa. I can't do that. Don't put my picture anywhere, you know? So it, it was, you had to be careful. Yeah, you no, could, I, I You totally, could ruin somebody's life, yeah. you know, if you weren't careful. 
I totally understand that. And certainly it's something I've heard from other artists as well too, um, in the sense, number one, they had to be careful about uh, inadvertently outing somebody in those at those times. But also the other thing that I've heard too is that um, a lot of the documentation from the 70s and 80s and, and even into the 90s and to some degree to, today too, but thankfully things are a little easier, um, is that it was nice to be able to document the community in these places in the daylight because so much of the community got together in darkness. It was either in bars or in restaurants or, or you know, on the streets. And, and here it was nice to see people in the light. And I think that's really interesting about that. Okay. Let's move on to the next one, Emery. Oh. Well, these are the same women, uh, Pagan and Katie, who are on the cover. Yeah. And the reason I uh, put this one in here is that in addition to the quotes from the literature, one of the things that I did, if the women in the um, photographs wanted to, was that I put quotes from them. And uh, I love this particular quote because Pagan says, uh, I'll read this one if you don't mind. Sure, I'd love to. Pagan said, Pagan is the one with the braid. Uh, she said, I had the dream American home in the suburbs with the cars and the garden and the three children. I thought I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, but I felt like a miserable failure anyway. Mm -hmm. And then I started reading all that feminist literature. And Katie says, when we moved into this house together, Pagan had been cooking for her family for 25 years. And so she wouldn't cook at all. I cooked the first dinner and the frozen vegetables were still icy when we bit into them. Tastes fine to me, she said. <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting how things, you know, get, given the circumstances, how things change and what was a priority at one time is no longer a priority when you've got things going right for you. Um, how was it that you met Pagan and Katie? Well, Katie uh, was an activist and I think I met her at a conference somewhere and uh, Famously, I remember that when I showed up, this is, they lived in a little log cabin. I mean, she calls it our house together, but it's really a tiny little log cabin. And I showed up and <laughs> they said, where have you been all this time? We've been waiting for somebody to come. <laughs> and, you know, memorialize our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, um, of course, it's a great way of saying it. it raises the question, as you went through your professional career, um, were you fortunate enough to have a, uh, to have a good um, coterie of women around you who were good allies, both personally and professionally, who, who were supportive? I think you can't do anything without a supportive community. I'm a huge believer in community and um, I have been in community my whole life. What I didn't have a lot of though, Hunter, was, um, you know, I've stayed mostly in Washington, D.C. and it, it's not known as a center for artists. It is a great activist center. But um, I had to uh, go other places to build community with other uh, lesbian photographers. And I was very fortunate that T. Corinne sort of took me under her wing and mentored me. And then uh, we, with Ruth Mountain Grove and some other people, uh, did something called the photography ovulars, which were you know, workshops for lesbian photographers. So I did eventually have a community of, of other lesbian photographers, but that didn't happen in, in the place I was living. 
-hmm. but other community definitely happened in the place I was living mm -hmm. and uh, and was very supportive of me. I, I will I want to say one one thing about you know s surviving as a lesbian photographer and doing this work um, all my life. Never in all the years I was a still photographer, this changed when I went into filmmaking, but in all the years I was a still photographer, I never was on the staff of any, I never had any institutional support. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a, a, a staff job. I didn't have fellowships or grants or prizes or residencies or anything, nothing. All my work was self-assigned and self-financed. Mm -hmm. And the way that I financed it was through lesbian community. Mm -hmm. People came to my slideshows, people came to my workshops, people bought my books, my postcards, my calendars. And if the community had not wanted my work, and had not supported my work, I, I wouldn't have been able to survive. Mm. And, I, and, and you my, were able to make it live. Well, I wouldn't call it a living. You were <laughs> I, I, had, <laughs> I lived, I lived through it. I lived yeah. through uh, icy uh, winters and dark rooms with no heat and all kinds of things, but you know, sure. um, was it was uh, something I wanted to do, and I was very grateful for the support of my community. Yeah, it's so beautifully said the way uh, the way that you describe that experience. And of course, many people, you know, many young queer artists and photographers, they may feel like they have to move to New York or move to Los Angeles and be around other artists. And I totally understand that. Um, but then, of course, it gets very expensive for, for, for them to do that. Um, and um, but the trade off, of course, is trying to be around a community of like minded individuals and like minded artists as well, too. And, um, and I, it's it's hard, of course, for people to be in other cities without artists uh, to be able to have that interaction that that happens. There's a question that just popped up here that I want to uh, bring up. Um, so the, the question was, and you, you made a, um, you made a re reference to this before about having other jobs like at the ca camera store. And so I'm sure that there were other ways uh, that you were able to help uh, put some food on the t table as well too over the years. I only took other jobs, well, it took the, the camera store job so I could learn photography, but I only took other jobs and mostly they were temp jobs that friends of mine would hire me for. Very rarely if I was, you know, desperate for money, mostly I mm. didn't have other jobs. Yeah. Well, of course, that's a wonderful way of being able to live as an artist and being able to make your work and just making enough money to in order to survive. Um, and so uh, people have thrown up a lot of great things here on the chat. Um, and so there is a link um, that somebody has put up on YouTube to Audre Lorde. And so please take a moment, uh, c copy that and take a moment to look at that. And then also old lesbians can contribute their histories to the old lesbian oral uh, history project. And the link is there. They're interested in interviewing lesbians who are at least 70 years old. Uh, to my great disappointment, Jeb has already been interviewed. Uh, <laughs> but you know, of course, that's why programs like this are very important because we we yet again have another oral history from, yeah, from somebody true. else. Here. That's true. And, and it's, it's really great. It's, it's great for us to be able to document it. And you know we're never done with recalling our history. And of course, anything you thought about that what that you didn't put in the last history, we have eight more mi minutes. You get to throw anything in this one that you haven't mentioned as well, too. Well, just somebody just asked me if I uh, photographed uh, at music festivals. I yeah. photographed at the Michigan Women's Music Festival for many, many years. I 
did not go to Numer, which uh, she mentions, but I did go to the Southern Women's uh, Music and Comedy Festival and to the uh, Rhythm Fest, uh, which was also in the South. And um, there, uh, I, I have quite uh, a lot of pictures from Michigan and one of them is an eye to eye. Oh, it's sure. a diptych, so theoretically, two of them are in eye to eye. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your films. Of course, I want to look, look at some more work at the book too, but I just want to, since we have a little bit of time left here, I want to talk a little bit about how you transitioned to the films and, and what brought you down that path. Well, I was, as you can see, even in my first book, I was interviewing the women in the photographs because I always wanted the people to have their own voice. You know, I wanted, um, them to be able to speak for themselves. So then I started making slideshows and I would narrate the slideshows. And then I was transferring the slideshows to video. And then I said to myself one day, you know, there's an easier way to do this. And I got a video camera. Hmm. Um, and that is uh, the two things that really um, moved me in that direction were wanting the pictures to talk and wanting to be in a collaborative um, uh, work situation. Because when you're a still photographer, it, you're very solo. You're pretty much doing it on your own. And unfortunately now that's more true of video making, but at that time you had to have a sound person and a lighting person and you worked with other editors and you know it was it was a really much more of a collaborative and team effort and i was yearning for that mm -hmm. and and could i just piggyback on that and say as somebody who self published both of my books working with the team at anthology editions who came to me and said, let's reissue I to I. And I said, oh, okay, let's <laughs> do that. And they were a dream to work with. It was, it was so, it was such a joy mm -hmm. to work with them. And uh, you know, uh, I, I I I enjoyed it every minute of it. And just as a reminder to everybody, the re-edition of Eye to Eye by Anthology Books, uh, it's a beautiful, uh, hardbound book, and it's really just uh, absolute uh, first rate. And I'm sure you can get it from your local bookstore. If your local bookstore doesn't have it, uh, ask them to get it for you. Um, and I'm sure you can get it online as well, too. Uh, we just put up a link here of being able yep. to order it as well, too. But definitely it's something that you would want to be able to have as far as um, a bit of the past, but then also it's very much of the present. There's one of the one of the beautiful things about the images in this book, of course, is that they feel very much of today. Um, and uh, there's you, I mean, there's a t timelessness to these to, to these images that you've made, Jeb. That I don't know that you thought about that at the time, of course. But you know, t today, now, uh, forty years l later, they r really just have great uh, staying power. I appreciate your saying that, and um, I have to say that going back to them, I had a much higher opinion. <laughs> How good they were <laughs> than I did at the time that I made them when I was so self-critical because I thought I would never have another chance to make a book and I just wanted it to be so good and I didn't think it was and and now I think it's awfully good so I hope I, I, uh, <laughs> I enjoy it when other people say that well, I wouldn't be saying if it weren't true. I think what's interesting about it is they don't they don't feel stuck in any particular time period. They just feel like wonderful. Uh, they just feel like wonderful captures, and and uh, and that's the simplicity of them that brings it through. Well, we have just a few more minutes uh, left here, and I would just like to go through a few of these comments here. 
Um, Jeb, you are an icon in the lesbian community. Never doubt that your uh, photography influenced and supported the spirit of the lesbian movement. So that's a, a wonderful kudos to you. Um, Thank you. There's a request here about uh, talking more about the Mabel Hampton photo. Well, there are two photos of Mabel Hampton. Number 11, Emery, one of them is um, Mabel walking down the street. Oh, that's what I looked like when I made the book. That uh, was me, well, yeah, that was not let's, Mabel. Let's, let's look at you for a second. Emery, can we put that picture with the red jacket up again? It's such a great picture. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm an old gray haired old dyke now, but I want people to remember that when I was doing this work, I was actually young. Yeah, young, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's hard. I think it's hard for young people to imagine older people <laughs> were ever young. <laughs> Well, I know when I made the pictures of Pagan and Katie, I never thought I would be that age. Right. <laughs> I never thought I was going to look like Pagan and Katie. I know it's, you know, it happens to all of us in the sense that, of course, time goes on. Uh, there's a nice note here for those of you, you who haven't seen it, about to rent or purchase uh, Jeb's films. Uh, there's a link here for you to be able to do that. Um, and uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Or, uh, Emery, gonna happen. which is great. Thank you. Um, and let me just see if I can get a few. There we go. Uh, um, Emery, if we can get back to the PowerPoint, we have a few more. Oh, um, and, and an anonymous attendees asked the question, could you speak about the uh, photograph in front of the Dyke sign in Virginia? Yes, that is a self-portrait, and um, Dyke is a little town out in Virginia that, yeah. uh, you know, you pass if you're going down to the Shenandoahs, and um, I was there with my uh, lover at the time, Mary Farmer, and we set this all up, and um, That is also when I was young, Hunter. And I <laughs> love that the this, this picture was in a, a wonderful um, exhibition uh, called Art After Stonewall uh, that Jonathan Weinberg uh, curated. And it was um, traveled all over the country, but it was also made into a, a great book. And I like his comment. He said, can you imagine, you know, it's 1979. <laughs> Look how happy this person <laughs> looks standing under a sign that says Dyke. And I thought, yeah, that, that's me. And for those of you who have not seen that exhibition, um, we were involved at Leslie Lohman and, and trying to get that exhibition going. And it was down here in Florida at the Frost Museum. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know if the pandemic affected it, but I do believe its final stop was in Ohio. Either it was at Columbus and it, it uh, people were able to go see it before uh, the pandemic. Yeah, which is so great. It was in New York, uh, Miami and Columbus. Yeah, and it's just, uh, it's an amazing trove of work. Uh, it's just, it blows your mind from one end to the mm -hmm. other, all the work in, in that show. And yes, John, it's worth uh, looking at looking at the book. Yeah, it's a the great book. Really too. just amazing. Yeah. Anyway, we don't want to, this is not the picture we were looking for. <laughs> uh, Emery, if we can just go back to one more. There we go. Uh, oh. This is one of, we, we had this at the Leslie L Lohman uh, M Museum as well too. And this of course is such a great picture. Talk to us a little bit about that one. Well, that uh, picture was taken in Willits, which is a little town north of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jane Gurko and uh, was partners at that time with Sally Gerhardt, who is a wonderful, wonderful, uh, important person in lesbian uh, history and they're making a film called Sally and you should look it up and donate to them so they can finish that film. But they were building a little house 
in this very, very rural area and, you know, in the woods and nobody was around. And uh, that's what it looked like. They were building the stairs at that point. Mm. Amazing piece. Yeah. Well, Jeb, it's so great to see you and spend time with you. And uh, this has been just a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for sharing everything uh, that you have here th this evening. Uh, I don't want to thank all of you for joining us. And of course, if you have friends who have not been able to join us tonight, know that this is being taped and uh, it will be on our website. Uh, I want to say a shout out to all of our friends on Facebook. Thank you for joining us as well, too. Uh, it's a great way for people to see things. And uh, one last thing, uh, I want to say uh, thank you to Emery Grant, who's behind the scenes here. Emery, uh, nice Yay. to see you. Yeah. Yay, uh, Emery. Good job, man. Yeah, great, great job. And so if you're not um, getting our announcements, uh, go to stonewall-museum.org. There's also a donate button. You can do that as well, too. And um, so, Jeb, one last time, many thanks. Great to see you. And uh, I hope we get to work together again soon. I hope so, too. Thanks so much, Hunter. I enjoyed it. Yes, I did, too. Good night, everyone.